Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Schwartz. Uh, Dr. Schwartz earned his bachelor and master in electrical engineering here at Rice, and uh, he later received the PhD uh, from University of Texas in Biomedical Sciences. Uh, currently, he is the director of clinical research at Nanospectra Biosciences here in Houston, where he's responsible for developing the laser delivery method for Nanospectra hour laser therapy. Uh, he has been working in, uh, before joining Nanospectra in 2005, has been working in several other companies, including lithium resource systems, bioquantum technologies, and even uh, Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech and MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, he has been involved in several projects in different fields, including uh, optical data telemetry, CO2 laser welding, and deep space laser communication and photodynamic therapy. And today he's going to talk about uh, rice developed nanoparticle directed cancer therapy. And uh, so mm -hmm. let's welcome him. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've, so I finally learned to, to hold down a regular job. Um, this, year, this uh, spring actually marks 40 years since I graduated from this place, which is, makes me the oldest person in here. Um, in fact, when, when I graduated, this, where this building is sitting now was actually occupied by an even then obsolete Van de Graaff generator. <laughs> I was warned by one of the uh, graduate students who worked at that facility that the concrete barrier uh, at which they fired particles didn't quite block all of them. They actually would launch uh, above that barrier. Um, and we were warned that we actually should not live in Florida because they calculated that's where the energized particles came back down. <laughs> I did want to send a shout out to, uh, per Dr. Steger's talk, I want to send a shout out to the gentleman who uh, recognized the little red envelope from uh, Netflix because I had un was under the assumption that my wife and I were the last people in North America who got those. Um, what I did want to do, though, besides going down a, a little uh, memory trail, was to talk about the uh, nanoparticles as being part of the rice experience. Um, Robert Curl came here. I didn't realize he was a student here. He came here as a student in 1950 and then went away, got his uh, uh, doctorate, came back and joined the faculty in 1967. R uh, Richard Smalley joined him and came here in 1976, according to his Wikipedia page, explicitly to work with Dr. Curl. And um, in 1985, they published uh, about the development of C60, this, this buckyball, this uh, Buckminster fullerene, this, this really first major class of um, nanoparticle for which they and um, Dr. Croto earned a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996. And then Naomi Hallis, whose pictures you've seen at least twice by now, came here in 1990 um, and published, she published on uh, the development of the Nana Shell, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, in 2003. And actually published, and that's actually, uh, I'll come back to that because that's when the patent for it was first issued. And then somewhere in there, uh, I was uh, at this school as an undergraduate. So I wanted to talk a little bit about startup companies. Um, the lifeblood of any biotech company, in particular, um, has to do with intellectual property. You start with an idea or you have some patent portfolio already developed or something in process. Most companies do not do basic research anymore. Most basic research, almost all basic research in this country is actually done in academia. So companies will generate their own internal intellectual property mostly geared to implementing or protecting a market position. The other way of protecting a market position is to keep it a deep, dark secret. Um, and then the other source of uh, intellectual property is, comes from academia primarily, and that's where my company, Nanospectra, gets its. The Nanoshell, as I mentioned, it was developed here at Rice and was patented, which means Rice owns it. Um, and so our company was formed explicitly to license that particular particle. So once a year or once a quarter, my boss writes a big check to the Rice Development Office. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> the other thing you need is great piles of money uh, over a long period of time until you can take a particular bit of intellectual property and actually make it into a real product. And the real product in this case is something that has to be done in, for a biotech company is something to be made into a drug or a device, which means that the three most important letters to a biotech company are F, D, and A. Um, 
The FDA, there we go, classifies and regulates drugs and medical devices and reviews them for two things, safety and efficacy. And so my next point is, in all the talks we've had with the FDA since 2003, they've never asked us if our therapy works. My boss asks me that every day. The clinicians ask us that very regularly. We're going to meet with the FDA on Monday. They may ask for efficacy data, but to date, they've never asked us anything about whether it works or not. They only care about, oh, I thought that was the laser, sad. Uh, they only care about safety. That's all right. I, I'll wave my hands instead. There, oh, there we go. Thank you. They only, they, to date, they have only cared about safety, which is where we have spent the great bulk of our money. So what is a drug and what is a device? It's a very useful distinction. A drug, uh, you might recognize a substance, blah, 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 but a substance other than food intended to affect the structure or function of the body, which is to say it will be interact chemically or metabolically with the body. By contrast, a device is an instrument, apparatus, etc., that does not achieve any of its primary intended purposes through chemical action and which is not dependent on being metabolized. That's the, the hard distinction that the FDA makes between drugs and devices. And so for us, that's really handy because nanoshells are in fact a device and are regulated as a device. Even though, um, like other implantables, even though we will inject and infuse nanoshells intravenously before we use them, that you can't, the next question you would ask about well, what do they do to the body, the answer is, well, they sit there until you get close to them with an optical source. So they're not actually a drug. Um, a lot of nano nanoparticles cross over into this, this realm of being starting as devices, but as soon as you start interacting with the, the host, then you fall into that other category of, of drug. Um, drugs are um, ubiquitous. A drug trial will cost easily 100 times as much as a device trial. So we have resisted all... Um, attempts to say, oh, why don't you decorate the nanoshell with uh, fluorophores or tracer elements? You can do that readily, um, but you can't keep them a device if you do it. So uh, our experience, the FDA, uh, the FDA changed its definition of what's a nanoparticle. They increased it um, to 1,000 nanometers in scale or smaller. That's good for us because we didn't actually used to be a nanoparticle, uh, but practically any nanoparticle is, is a particle or a device whose functionality arises by virtue of its size, not just simply that it can do chemistry on a small scale, but the size of the particle itself is fundamental to how it works. So this is how you make or what, what a therapeutic nanoshell, as opposed to any number of other um, nano devices, could be. So we start with a, a non-conducting uh, insulating core of silica and then grow, use some wet bench chemistry and black magic and grow a gold shell around it. And then because we want it to not immediately trigger an immune response in the body, we want it to be able to circulate, we'll coat it with a polyethylene glycol, which is a, a just common hydrocarbon that's used to coat other devices and, and drugs to, so that the um, body's immune system essentially ignores it. And you end up with a particle about 150 nanometers in diameter. This graph, uh, I'm going to ask you not to think about this graph. I want you to think back to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Rabajazi's uh, graph that was, that was very sexy and had the green wave undulating and showing the, the electron shell oscillating. That's, that's way cooler than this one. But, the, but it does the same thing. Okay, it came out of the same laboratory, so it might as well. Um, it does the same thing. Basically, photons interact and distort the electron field um, in, the, the, um, sh in the gold shell. You can think of, a, of, a, of a, um, a nanoparticle in that sense as like a tuning fork, an optical tuning fork. You whack it with, with some photons and it will start to ring. And that ringing basically results in the emission of optical wavelength phonons, also known as heat. The other thing you can do with them is if you're willing to play some games with how big you make the core and how thick you make the shell, you can actually make them tunable. So for different shell thicknesses and different um, core sizes, you can actually make these nanoparticles absorb optical radiation in different parts of the spectrum. And that turns out to be very handy when you're working, well, in anything, but in the body in particular. In the human body, um, the thing that absorbs most light is hemoglobin. It's 
It absorbs down here. Here's the visible spectrum, blue to red. Um, outside the visible spectrum, hemoglobin is not nearly as absorbing. Um, water is becoming more absorbing. But if you insert uh, some particle here uh, that does absorb in the infrared, then you can actually get it to take up most of the, or some appreciable portion of the light. So the logic of the whole nanoparticle thing is that we're using them as a way of enhancing the absorption of optical radiation, which they will immediately turn into heat. So that's one half of what makes them work. This is a, a uh, oh yeah, let me back up here. Uh, I, the, the usual sheet for trying to put a data that looks pretty sloppy is you put it on a log scale, and that compresses it nicely. But this basically gives you an idea of the huge range of optical absorption that you have to contend with. In the near infrared, um, we can actually develop a, a concentration of nanoparticles such that they are the, one of the principal absorbers in the body, and so wherever they collect, um, you will get um, a um, enhanced absorption. So 150 nanometers, that to scale is a nanoparticle compared to a red blood cell, a leukocyte, or a platelet. So here's how, here's the logic of what's going on. This is going to, uh, this will look a bit like, uh, again, Dr. Uh, Robajazi's talk, where we're not using the particle to drive a reaction, but to just generate heat, and we're counting on the location of the particles to give us the, the therapeutic benefit. So if you have optical energy, you insert it into the body, some endogenous set of absorptions generates heat, and you'll end up with um, a plume of heat that's located at and shaped roughly like whatever it was you used to generate the, to deliver the light. If on the other hand you have a set of nanoparticles that can collect selectively in certain pockets of tissue, then you can develop a greater amount of heat that's more selective to that tissue, and in our case, I'll tell, explain why, you can generate a tumor-specific hyperthermia. And if you drive the reaction a little bit further, uh, then you can actually start to denature protein, exactly analogous, in fact, very analogously to what happens when you drop an egg into a hot frying pan, because what happens is all the proteins denature, they uncoil, they become opaque. So optical scattering goes up, optical absorption uh, and tissue penetration goes down, and then the fluence in that area goes up, and that leads to even more heat being generated in that area. That will cause, eventually, the microvasculature will collapse. That means that perfusive, perfusive cooling will drop. That will generate even more heat, and eventually you will have a um, photocoagulation if you've played your cards right with the amount of energy that you put into that region and you have the right amount of nanoparticles. So um, here's the example. The rest of this will be dedicated to the particular clinical trial we've been running. Um, Prostate disease, 161,000 or so cases. Um, the prostate is not a critical organ. You can take it out uh, with a, a four and five chance of uh, erectile dysfunction and a two-thirds uh, likelihood of being incontinent pretty much permanently. Um, it's easily diagnosed, or at least it's inferred with a, a PSA screening. It's typically slow growing. Um, it's frequently senescent. Uh, my father-in-law was diagnosed with um, prostate disease in his late 70s. He died in 1999 at the age of 84 of heart disease. Um, it is, in fact, the case that more men will, they, they, you, you've heard the story, more men will die of, uh, die with prostate disease than die of it. That's certainly the case. But if you had a focal therapy where you could kill the disease and not have all the side effects of, of a resection or of radiation, that would be kind of handy. So. Focal therapy is based on the idea that before cancer is metastatic, it inevitably is local. Um, early detection, which is where almost all of the increase in longevity from cancer in this country has occurred in the last 50 years, not because uh, metastatic disease has been rendered curable. Uh, some cancers, such as prostate, are actually slow-growing or even senescent. One of the recommendations for slow-growing uh, prostate disease is actually what's called active surveillance, which means don't do anything unless until it really starts to bother you. And when it does, then it would be handy to have some therapy that uh, would interdict um, systemic therapy to be able to take it out. So here's the other bit. I've, I've kind of talked past 
um, what you can do with nanoparticles, but why would you, uh, in these nanoshells, how do you actually make them useful as a cancer therapy? And the answer is that cancers have a number of weaknesses. Solid tumors in particular have a, um, um, a flaw in their mechanism. They generate, the process of angiogenesis, of generating new blood supply, is what tumors do as they grow in order to supply themselves. And they do it quickly, and they do it really badly. This is a, a uh, uh, EM of a, um, uh, the cross-section of a um, mammary capillary that was a mammary cancer capillary. The structure, the stroma of the, um, or sorry, the, the scaffolding of the, of the uh, uh, capillary has been laid down, but the endothelial layer was just bypassed. They just, they didn't get the contract to do that. These holes, or fenestrations, are typically on a micron scale. And that's useful to us um, in this regard. A lot of people think of blood flow. I've seen pictures of blood, uh, you know, illustrations of blood flow that look like water coming out of a, a fire hose in the aorta, maybe. But in the capillary bed, that's not actually true. In the capillary bed, uh, the red blood cells are essentially the same size as the, the vessel they're trying to flow through. So um, you can think of this boulder as like a red blood cell. You can think of poor Indiana Jones as a nanoparticle. And you can think of this uh, thing he just came out of as a capillary fenestration. So if he doesn't make it out of the cave, he can get squished down in the fenestration. And that's, in fact, what happens to nanoparticles. They will collect in these fenestrations passively, because again, it's a device. Um, you could attach, you could attach uh, things on it to uh, markers, to surface markers, to attach it to the cell wall, and then it would be a drug. Um, poor Indiana. All right. Uh, the other thing you need to do, so you have a catchment mechanism for nanoparticles, and you need a way of exciting them. And so this is where the uh, internally developed IP that companies use just for, for um, making their machinery. This is the uh, tip of an optical fiber. It's got a, a little diffuser on it. It basically looks like an 18 millimeter long glow stick. Um, but you can put um, tens of watts into and hence out of these things. Um, and you can attach that. There's the, the end of the glow stick there. This is basically a, a laser catheter de or a laser delivery device that we developed and are patenting um, that consists of a catheter that is placed into the um, uh, uh, tumor and then it's supplied by an optical fiber and the fiber and then a coolant system. So this is this going to start playing on its own? Let's see. No. Okay. So this is our high. Uh, this is our toxic particles there we go. are approximately 150 nanometers in diameter or about 50 times smaller than a red blood cell. In the first stage of Oralase therapy, a solution containing aura shells is infused into the bloodstream of the patient, allowing them time to collect in the lesion. Most cancerous lesions have poorly formed blood supplies, leaving small holes in the blood vessels that the aura shells are small enough to pass through, leading to an accumulation of the particles in the target area. And that leads to, that can lead to a therapy like this. So you've got an infusion of nanoparticles that occurs at a, a particular time. And then once the nanoparticles have left the bloodstream and collected where they collect in the tumor and such, then you can set the patient up for this newer therapy um, by uh, Philips of um, Netherlands. The Uranav is their, their operating system here, where they can take a multi-parametric MRI do a series of slices and build a 3D model of the prostate and of the tumor that they've identified within it, and then pass that over to um, a, um, a port that over to a, an ultrasound device so that a, a clinician working in a clinic situation can actually have access to MRI imaging. You don't actually have to do this in uh, within the um, within the gantry. And so what this leads us to this is kind of our, some of our you know. Earlier results, pretreatment. This shows um, on a T2 image, you know, a dark area that shows where the tumor uh, was, and then 48 hours later, after being ablated uh, with having nanoparticles collected in it and having been ablated, uh, we have this inclusion in the prostate, but the prostate itself is actually still in situ. 
Um, and we've been able to do this without any of the, uh, uh, the patients so far, without any of the side effects that we typically would see with um, prostate resection. This is 12, some 12 month data, and basically the, um, the hole begins to resolve. The tissue will begin to fill in and re, um, re endothelialize. So, what we want, I'm going to pass on these is all the good things about cancer therapy that's effective, minimally invasive, focal, uh, doesn't preclude any later therapies, and it's cost effective. If we come up with a treatment that is just as good as high flu or anybody else, it just happens to be more expensive and we're still out of the business. So we have to come up with something that's usable and cost effective. And at that point, it's time to come back to the academia. This is a chart. Uh, this is a set of models that was done by Dr. Alabastri, who uh, gave my um, nice introduction. He's been working up some 2 and 3D models for how the heat is evolved, um, how coagulation, coagulation develops, and how heat is evolved um, into a model tissue. And of course, as a lot of y'all are familiar with, once you have this basic model, then you can start fine-tuning it and adding uh, the complications that you would actually find in a um, in a uh, um, uh, actual um, clinical setting. And the other thing is uh, Dr. Hallis's lab is still in business, and they've come up with a, a newer version of a nanoparticle which says why instead of that, um, that um, uh, um, silica core, what if you had something paramagnetic, i.e. something that an MRI would see, and then build a nanoparticle around that, just like that. And so, of course, um, that is now a patent, a, an application, a patent that will Rice will also earn, and so when we license that, we'll be sending you even more checks. So that's, that's what I have. Um, that is basically the result of Rice-based research that went out and, like me, came back. So. <laughs> I may be out of time. So that, that was a really cool talk. Um, one of the things that you mentioned several times was this, this um, device versus a drug mm -hmm. uh, di difference. Obviously, still sort of being in academia, we, we just like to imagine things however we can imagine them, and that's a constraint of the mm -hmm. real world. So I'm just curious about the, the strategy that you guys are, 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 are pursuing. Are you pursuing this device because you believe that once it's approved, it will be easier to modify into a drug? Mm -hmm. Or is just the strategy to just get one thing through and then, and then run with it for yeah. a long time? That's actually it there. The, the chart that I said had, showed that had money on it. It's all the, the money that we have has been raised um, basically by angel investors, by uh, the board of directors passing the hat. It's way, way cheaper. You can get something to the market a lot faster and a lot cheaper that way. Once you and, and the other thing the other thing that allows you to do is okay you've proved the technology in doing that, then you can go and do something really fancy. The the problem with um, with anything a medical device or a drug is the years long um, cycle that it takes to prove this. You have to prove again with the dr drugs in particular. I mean, you can listen to any number of how many recall notices have been issued for drugs that have been out twenty years. It takes forever to finally tease out all of these results. So. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was started as a laser jock, so I'm kind of a device guy anyway. Um, so apologies to all the, the microbiologists here. But it was just, it's a, a much simpler route to market. And then one, but, but it also proves out the basic concept of the technology. Once that's done, then you've overcome a major hurdle the next time you go back to the regulatory agencies and say, okay, now I would like to do this other fancy thing on this platform that you've already approved. Hi, I remember being here in this auditorium, I think about 15 years ago, and uh, the lady who you keep mentioning, who I should remember the oh, name Oh, Naomi Hallis, yes. Um, she, I think it was her that was up there talking about this, mm -hmm. and it seemed like a very similar talk in my hazy memory. That was back when Netflix sent DVDs by mail, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it was a long time ago. So, so uh, what I'm just kind of curious, it, it's, it was totally cool then, and then, you know, like five years later, I was like, why isn't everybody using this now? And now you're coming up and saying it's nearly there, it's nearly there. Um, so 
is it, how is this better than chemotherapy and or radiation and or proton therapy and or, 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 or? You know, I, I'm just kind of, it never really comes across, I guess. Mm -hmm. The claim is if the particles themselves self-segregate to actual tumor, um, and if you are, and uh, photon, uh, you know, photonic radiation itself is inherently focal. It only, you, you only get a few millimeters of spread of, of photons in tissue, so you inherently can focus your, your, your therapy to a particular area. The problem, of course, with chemo, people use chemo, it's nasty stuff, but it works, but it's systemic. It's, it's slow poison that you administer everywhere. You just place a bet that the cancer will die slightly faster than the patient. Radiation is the same sort of thing. Radiation and proton therapy are finer tuning versions of the same thing, and they're, they're used because they work. But there's a, still an enormous spillover, an enormous centimeter. I don't know if you, if you are in a small organ, um, a centimeter of spillover is a lot, particularly if there are nerve bundles and other things nearby that you want to spare. So it's, it's the idea that photonic therapy coupled with this, this uh, uh, tumor-specific uh, particle can give you something that really is focal. So, so is, that, uh, is that, as it were, has there been research that's shown that, or is that just... The, I mean, surely you could test that hypothesis. Have you done that? Oh, yes. This was done in the, when, when uh, Dr. Hallis built the, the first nanoshell, it was actually quite easy to get grant funding if you, put the, if you drop the word nanoparticle in it. Um, the bloom is kind of off the rose now. You can still get some funding for that. But there was a lot of early on work, not just, sa not just safety work. We, had, we spent the bulk of the money on, uh, on research on proving safety, pyrogenicity, toxicity, long-term stability, blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot of the, the research was done on trying to fine-tune this model of, and a lot of it was done in uh, M real time in MRI, which is a, an expensive way to do things, but you can practically, but in clinical, but if you have a grant funding for it, you can prove a lot of technology um, by making the, the tests that you were just describing. So you can do, you can actually do efficacy studies. Like I said, the FDA hasn't asked us about efficacy, but everybody else does. And so we have to be, we have a whole string of papers we have to prove that yes, it actually does work, and it works like we say it does. One more question. So where are you in the FDA process? We are, we are finishing up the, our third clinical trial. Uh, this is in, and this one, is, this is the first one in prostate. It is called a phase one slash two. The, the devices follow, are, uh, follow a slightly different path than, than the traditional phase one, two, three drug study. So the number that the FDA typically holds for a new device is 100. You test it in 100 people, you give them your data package, and then at that point you will be given uh, permission to do what's called a pivotal trial, which is basically things for pre-market certification. The thing that you would take to clinicians and maybe some companies either to sell the company or to start selling product. So we're at that, we're right now we're in what, what's technically called a phase one, two trial because we want to show safety and efficacy, but what comes after that will be an actual um, uh, multi-center uh, efficacy trial. So one other question. Can you tune this thing so that instead of using light, you could use x-rays? Because you've gotten, we've gotten fairly good about Mm -hmm. Focusing the X-rays in specific areas, and you could get a lot more energy that way. You can. Um, the particle. Let me think. I may have to pass on that because the, I, you you would have a, a fundamentally a different structured particle because the, the photon. I mean, the X-ray photon is like way 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 much shorter wavelength. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, you don't you don't really get an antenna effect with with the, with any kind of metal. Yeah. Yeah. So you would have, like again, yeah, the pro, the proton beams are, are kind of the, the the state of the art for that, and there's still some spillover. Yep. I'm sorry. The, you, you can tune the shell, but over this fairly narrow range of visible to near IR. Um, fundamentally, once you, once you go all the way to X-ray, then you've got, you're in a completely different regime. Thank you very much.